Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you here in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, I pray that everyone had a Merry Christmas. We're very um, blessed this morning to have uh, Rebecca Saucer with us again. And Rebecca's close to ordination now. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, going to be placed as a full time in July, and then I'll begin kind of the pre observation process of that. Well, praise God, and we'll be praying for you. Um, as we come together this morning, I just would like for us uh, to, to remember the people throughout the season, this, this Christmas season, that didn't have it as fortunate as we ourselves, and um, just to kind of remember them and our prayers. And also, let us just be in celebration of, of the, you know, that Jesus, you know, was born on, on the 25th, at least that's what we celebrate. And that, you know, what we look forward to is his coming again. But at this time, I'd just like to uh, go ahead and open us in prayer, and uh, then we will stand for the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come together this morning. We just come opening our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you would come and, and, and do a work in each one of us. We ask that you would dig deep into our souls, Lord. Just come and, and help us hear the message, Lord, that you that, that Rebecca is actually bringing to us this morning, inspired by you, and also, Lord, for the all of the uh, worship that we will do this morning. May you be glorified. We love you so much, and we praise you, and we need you, Lord, more than than any day, Lord. Every day we need you more. You know, Lord, we just call out to you. Just come that your Holy Spirit have his way in us. Lord, just come, come fill us. We need more, more, oh Lord, of you, more. And Lord, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Rebecca to come up, and she's going to lead us in our worship this morning. Thank you again so much for the warm welcome. Uh, and while I'm moving the mic down, we're going to be opening to uh, 205 in the yellow hymnal, Joy to the World.
encourage you to be seated as we take uh, the offering of our tithes and offerings. Thank you again for the warm welcome, and once again, good morning. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you all especially for joining me today as uh, it was snowing this morning. And it was very beautiful, but it was also very cold. And even I found it a little hard to get out of bed this morning. <laughs> but I hope that everyone had a wonderful Christmas celebrating the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Emmanuel actually means God with us, and some have interpreted it as Christ with us. The Trinity of Father God, Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is truly among us right now. But what does that mean? God took on a new form through his Son Jesus, coming to earth and taking on the body of a human being. And Jesus Christ is both fully human and fully divine which can feel like an impossible cognitive dissonance of trying to hold these two ideas together in the same person. The divine is pure and holy, and God is so far above even our comprehension. So the divine, the idea that fully God fits in the same category as fully human, seems impossible. But we see in the first chapter of the Gospel of John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is that word, making him fully God and fully human. We know what it is like to be human. We mess up, we get hurt, we feel temptation at times, and we try our best. And I think that this is why I personally have always had a bit of an easier time connecting to Jesus, because he knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be in our position. And Christmas time brings us a ton of hymns that we don't get to really hear the whole rest of the year while singing. And thank you so much to our pianist for doing an excellent job. And the hymn Once in Royal David City has always been one of my favorites. And when I was singing it a few weeks ago, I was struck by the line that says that Jesus followed our childhood patterns, or he fit our childhood patterns, depending on which set of scripture you look at. It reminded me of the recommended lectionary reading for today, uh, which I didn't read, but can be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 42 to 52. This tells the story of when Jesus was visiting the temple with his mother, uh, Mary, and his father, Joseph. When their caravan began leaving, they traveled for a whole day until they realized that Jesus was not among any of the other children or among their family. So they immediately turned around and were very worried and began searching for him back in the city. They found him, uh, and he, Jesus was with the teachers in the temple, listening to them and asking questions, is what it says. And when Mary asked why he did this to Joseph and herself, because Jesus very nearly gave her a heart attack, he responded by saying that he clearly had to be in his father's house. This story has always been one of my favorites because, well, it's the only canonical story that we have after Jesus' birth before his ministry, and because it makes me feel a lot better knowing that even the mo most perfect person that ever existed still stressed out their parents. <laughs> the story also is good for parents because, you see, even the savior of the entire world gave his mother gray hair. It's the very last verse of this passage that I'd like to look at, though. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And I'd like to unpack this verse for a little bit. Just like uh, it says in the hymn, Jesus physically grew up as a human being. He scraped his knee and learned how to use a hammer and all that good stuff that I know I did, but maybe not everybody learned how to use a hammer. I don't know. Uh, but, yes, God did grant him an intimate knowledge of the scripture, but God didn't let Jesus cheat by knowing everything that he needed to know to succeed. Jesus physically grew in stature and grew increasing the wisdom that we all learn about how this world works. It's so comforting to know that no matter what it is that you're going through, you have a fully human and fully divine Savior that has already been there. And I personally like to think of Jesus as that cool older brother that's already done everything ahead of you, so you can always ask him for advice. The second part of the verse is just as important, though. Jesus also increased in favor with God and men. Now notice the listing of the order there. First God, then men. Jesus knew it was more important to first please God 
and then worry about people second. I've always found that people pleasing is a dead end, but pleasing God can be life giving. How do we please God, you may ask? Through following the example of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is awesome because we don't even have to figure out what will please God because Jesus has already taught us. He taught the apostles how to live in life and prepare for the everlasting life that they'll receive in heaven. And the reason that we still know about this today is because before Jesus left, he told the apostles in Matthew 28 that they needed to raise up disciples meaning to teach others the correct way to live. And we are all adopted as God's children because Jesus came down to save us. Christ is with us, so we need to celebrate. Another holiday that we're about to celebrate is the start of the new year. And I know many people start off the new year with a new year's resolution. Some of you may have some in mind. More often than not, this resolution includes some type of physical change that people want for their lives. Uh, which is why uh, gym memberships are at an all-time low if anyone needs one. <laughs> uh, people either want to lose weight or gain muscle or physically change in some way or other. Uh, some people take up a new practice or a hobby. They resolve to be more dedicated in some area of their life. I've heard resolutions like, I'm going to cook more instead of eating out all the time, or I'm going to practice the piano more, I'm going to walk the dog twice a day, I'm going to read for at least one hour every night. And these are all great and noble endeavors. But my question to you is, what is God calling to you this new year? That brings us to the passage that uh, I've read today from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. In this passage, Jesus has just met Matthew the tax collector and is having dinner with him. Jesus, Matthew, and all of Jesus' disciples are approached by a group of people that have been following the teachings of John the Baptist. Uh, if you know the Gospel of Matthew well, you'll remember that back in chapter 3, verse 1, it says that John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus, which fulfills the prophecy in the Old Testament. They want to know why Jesus and his disciples don't fast. And this is the passage which we get Jesus' response, that the disciples should not, not mourn when Jesus is with them. He says that there will be time to mourn when he's not with them, but for now they need to celebrate. Jesus then lists a few parables for John's followers. He says that you don't sew uh, an unshrunken patch of cloth onto an old garment because it'll make the material have a bigger hole. That one's pretty easy and straightforward. Uh, but the next one for me was a little more tricky until I learned more about what it meant. Jesus said that you don't put new wine into old wineskins because the skins will burst and the wine will be out and be ruined. Jesus then tells them that they need to put new wine into new wineskins. And the thing to keep in mind is that during this time, uh, everyone knew about the process of fermentation for wine. Wine was not the substance that we know it as today, but we can look to modern fermentation to understand what Jesus is talking about. The old skins that had already been used were expanded and worn out during the first time that they were used in the fermentation process. The bags were durable, but not so durable that they could withstand a second beating like that. This verse seems really appropriate for this time of year uh, because it calls our attention to the fact that Jesus is with us and that we are all being called to something new because of our relationship through him. Romans chapter 11, verse 29 says that God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. And this means that God's gifts to us never change. Jesus' presence with us does not change. And Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know if you can relate, uh, but 
With having just celebrated Jesus' birth, I sometimes struggle to find a balance between the tiny plastic Jesus in my little manger set up on the shelf and the adult grown Jesus who was nailed on the cross to die for my sins. Right now is the time just after Jesus' birth, but before very much longer, we'll actually be in Lent, which starts on March 6th. Uh, and as we work through the Lenten season, which to me feels like it's approaching very quickly, uh, some of you could probably relate, uh, we remember Jesus' death when he was laid in the tomb. And when this happened, the apostles were terrified. We read in the text that uh, even Peter denied knowing Jesus out of his own fear and desperation. The important thing for us to remember is that even as we recall this separation, Christ is still with us. Because Christ is with us, he is still calling us to something more. I normally like to bring a sermon back around to some sort of answer that we find in scripture. And there are plenty of them in there, believe me. Especially now as we celebrate that Christ is with us, I would encourage everyone to pick up your favorite gospel or maybe even one that you haven't read very often or paid much mind to. It's here in the story of Jesus' ministry that we find the instructions on how to live a righteous life in discipleship with one another and in relationship with our Creator God. That said, this message in particular leaves me with more questions than usual. In seminary, they say that you should preach the message that you need to hear, and I think right now God has laid before me many questions that I will share for your own pondering. What does it really mean to have, to my life, to know that Jesus is with us? The natural reflex is to say that because Jesus is with us, our relationship with God has been restored. And it was J uh, Charles Spurgeon that once said, you can stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if he were you. And that quote's very powerful, but the question remains for me. What does it mean to my life that Jesus is with us? The second question I'll leave you with is, are there places in your life where you're trying to put new wine into old wineskins? The new year is a great time to start a new year resolution or pick up a new hobby, or even do a little spring cleaning in our own lives. I'm not sure uh, where I'm trying to put new blessings from God into old, worn-out ways, but I guess that's why the question needs to be asked. Mark Twain once used the analogy that sometimes life is like boiling a frog. We don't really see the problem until it's too late in most cases. And that's why the wineskin is worth contemplation, because the bridegroom is here with us, so are we making the most of his blessing? Thank you for indulging me in my contemplation, and I invite you to join me as we begin the new year. Please join me for our closing hymn in the yellow hymnal on page 171.
this world that he has created, I invite all of you to remember the blessing that we've received through Jesus' presence and to search your own life and your heart for where we're being called to examine if we're putting new wine into old wineskins. Amen. Amen.